Mathematically speaking, concentric circles are circles with a common center point. So that to draw them, they look like circles around a circle, around a circle, around a circle, around a circle in perfect proportion. Each circle to the outside being larger than the previous one. Each of us is at the center of concentric circles. We have various circles of relationship and acquaintance, various spheres in the areas of our lives in which we are the center of each. I am at the center of all my experiences, no matter what circle I am inhabiting at the time. You are at the center of all the concentric circles of relationship that make up your life. Yes, it's a bit counterintuitive for white people to be centering themselves so much, but in a very real sense, every person is at the center of all their circles of relationship. And that's how we're looking at this this morning. At the center of the circle, for each of us, is our self. Yes, I know there's the Buddhist concept of no self, but that's an entirely different sermon. We'll get to that. So what we perceive as our self is at the center. And then the next circle is perhaps our partner, a romantic relationship. And then a next circle with immediate family, children, siblings, parents, extended family, a circle of friends, neighbors, a circle for church, work, school, a circle for hobbies and civic involvements. Each circle of our lives gets bigger, the diameter and circumference larger. And as that happens, we know the people in that larger circle less intimately. So little thought experiment, imagine for me, if you will, just a moment, your own circles of relationship. I'm hoping you can imagine yourself at the center. It's the trickiest one sometimes. And then let's expand each of us. Who's our next circle of relationship? And then let's bust that out to our close family. and extended family and or friends and your neighbors and workplace or school or social and civic involvements. You got a picture of the people in all those circles? Now I want you to think, how far out from the center did you need to go before there was a person of color? And this is what we mean by widening the circle of concern. How do we make it bigger to include more people not like us? Recently, in thinking about how we can get a better sense of where our whole congregation is at in terms of uh, anti-racism work, anti-racism and dismantling white supremacy and anti-racist understanding and multiculturalism, I had a really great conversation with our intern, Lynn, and we talked about the intercultural development inventory, which is something Lynn has taken in seminary. And I took many years ago, I was at a conference on religious volunteering out in California, and we took this assessment and they went over it with us. Um, I was stunned at the time where I scored. I thought I was so much better than I was. Go figure that. I'd love to take it again because I want to find out if I actually have learned anything in 20 years. It's a really interesting tool. It's recognized as one of the premier tools of its type in the world. And it's recognized as this across different cultures, which also I think gives it some gravitas. 
And the assessment is really brief. It's only about 15 minutes long, about 50 questions or so. It's not much, but it tells you a lot. And what it measures is where you fall on a scale, a developmental scale of intercultural competency and understanding. And like many developmental models, because they're developmental, their stages, everybody progresses in from one to another. You can't skip a stage, but most people at one time or another think and act or behave in a regressive stage. <laughs> so I wanna let you know what those stages are because I think they're fascinating and give a great way to frame or focus on how we can approach this thing. So the, the stage on one extreme end is called denial. And people operating out of denial deny, dismiss, and avoid difference. And these are from the IDI's own definitions. They see different others as stereotypes and avoid interaction with those who are different. They are usually disinterested in broadening their perspective. They usually have little experience dealing with people who are different. The next stage is called polarization. Those with this mindset see cultural differences always in an us versus them battle. Others are usually, not always, but usually seen as inferior. And the polarized approach may even support the cause of an oppressed minority, but have no understanding of that cause from the oppressed person's perspective. In the middle of their uh, spectrum, in between the monocultural perspectives and the multicultural perspectives is what they call minimization. Minimizers emphasize human similarities, common values. This usually takes two forms. One is I don't see color, which allows the dominant group to neglect the, the, the oppressed experience, you might say. And the other is the go along to get along approach, which is usually observed in oppressed groups because they need to avoid conflict to secure their own survival. That's where I scored the first time I took the test. I thought I was so enlightened. The next stage is acceptance. People with this mindset recognize and appreciate patterns of cultural difference and commonality in their own and other cultures. They're curious to learn how cultural patterns of behavior make sense within different cultural communities. And this involves contrastive self-reflection between one's own culturally learned perspective and the culturally learned perspectives and behaviors of different cultural groups. While curious, individuals operating out of the acceptance mindset are still not fully able to adapt to cultural difference. They may find it difficult to make ethical or moral decisions across cultural groups. While a person within the acceptance mindset embraces a deeper understanding of cultural difference, this leads to struggling with reconciling behavior in other groups that the person considers unethical or immoral in their own culture. For example, a person with an acceptance mindset may be very much trying to engage multiculturalism and yet still cannot understand for the life of them why there are Muslim women who want to wear a hijab. Or can't understand people thinking speaking Black American English dialect is okay. It's not correct English. Or may not be able to understand why anyone would use a they pronoun because they is plural. You can be doing a good job with multiculturalism 
can still have some real challenges. And at the far end, the most developed end of their scale is what they call adaptation. People with this approach are able to make two adaptations, cognitive frame shifting, shifting one's cultural perspective and behavioral code shifting, changing one's behavior in authentic and culturally appropriate ways. And this enables deep cultural and cross-cultural bridging in understanding. The biggest challenge for people at this stage, and there's no stage without challenges, is to not dismiss people who are at a lower stage. People who are in the adaptation stage have a lot of trouble tolerating the intolerant. Right? When I was in college, I started doing things and going places and meeting people that were far beyond my previous experience. Going to college blew my mind, literally out of my head. I grew up in a central Massachusetts factory in Milltown, full of working class people. Lemonster, Massachusetts was not a bad place, but it was not a mecca of forward thinking while I was growing up. Although it is much more diverse and different now than it was when I was growing up. But at the time, the diversity in town included a small synagogue, small Jewish congregation, some people from Puerto Rico, and a handful of black families. And you could go most days, weeks, months of your life without ever running into anyone who looked and behaved substantially different from you. Worcester, Massachusetts was the big city. <laughs> the Paris of the 80s, yes, their advertisement in the 80s, the Paris of the 80s. And Boston was the extreme height of megalopolis in the world. Remember the first time I ever went to New York City as a college age adult, I was terrified. It was just so big and so crowded. I like New York City now. I love visiting. We want to live there. Love visiting. But first time I went, boy, did it blow me away. I grew up in a place where my interaction and involvement with things different than myself was minimal till I got to college. And there, among other things I did, I got involved with Amnesty International, a human rights organization, works all over the world, and I did my college internship there. And while doing that, my circles exploded to include organizers of the Tiananmen Square protest whom I met. The Madres de la Plaza de Mayo, the mothers of the disappeared from Argentina, I met some of them. And let me tell you, this kid from central Massachusetts, his mind was just out the back of my skull. I could not believe the world I lived in and what had been going on without my knowledge. While I was doing that, I met and even dated for a while a young woman from Iran. My world was just completely re reshapen and enlarged. Her roommates were from China, and I had actual, not American Chinese restaurant, Chinese food. <laughs> it was really good. Those were my tiny steps into a much wider world, much bigger circles rippling out from my tiny little central Massachusetts pond. That's why when Rick Steve did his thing on travel as a political act a number of years ago, it really grabbed me. Because travel really does widen your perspective. And in a sense, entering into any place where you are different and things are all new to you is travel, whether it's down the street or halfway around the world. And if you can travel off the beaten path, stay away from the tourist hotels and attractions, 
to the back roads and neighborhoods and the local eateries where the locals actually hang out. Your experience grows geometrically. I'm pretty well traveled around the United States. I've been to 42 states and I've been to all the tourist things, you know, Disneyland, Niagara Falls, you know, riverboat on the Mississippi down in New Orleans. But it was kayaking in the Mississippi and Minnesota that was the real experience. I hadn't traveled out of North America, however, till I was about 50 years old. I lament that now. I, I, it's one of my real true regrets. Don't have many, but that's one of them. And I begged my son to take advantage of his college's semester abroad, but he wasn't interested. In Travel as a Political Act, Rick Steve says that the greatest souvenir you can bring home from travel is a broader perspective. And that's true whether the travel is halfway around the world or to a neighborhood in your own town you've never been to, full of people a lot different than you. Because you encounter things that are different from your own experience. And the more off the beaten path you go in your travel, whether it's nearby or around the world, all the much better. One of the reasons I did not travel abroad when I was younger is I was very anxious. I was nervous about doing so. Isn't it natural to be nervous and have anxiety about going to some place where you're different? And as I got older and learned to deal with anxiety and depression, I was married and had a child and there wasn't much money to save, never mind spend on travel. No one likes being uncomfortable. And yet the only way to widen our circles in any lasting way, the only way to truly broaden our perspective is to intentionally go be uncomfortable. How wide your horizon gets is directly related to how uncomfortable you are willing to be. How much discomfort can you handle? We've all heard the slogan, no pain, no gain. That's ridiculous. Pain's a warning sign, danger, something's wrong with pain. If you continue physical activity after pain from an injury, you're gonna do actually more damage, right? No pain, no gain is a myth. Pain is pain. Pain can shut you down and sometimes it should. But discomfort is another thing. You can be really uncomfortable, but not in pain. The day after working out or the second day after working out, you're gonna be sore. You're gonna be uncomfortable. But if you're in pain, you overdid it. You can get quite a lot. You can gain quite a bit without pain. Most of the time we can and should avoid pain, but it is almost impossible in this life to avoid some discomfort. And there are a lot of times when we shouldn't. And widening your circle of relationship and concern is one of them. Think of widening the circle as travel to a foreign land. There are foreign lands just miles from here some of us have never been to. And going there will shatter your perspective. And any small step you take in the direction of widening your circle is going to be uncomfortable, but it's going to be of monumental benefit. At some point, reading the tourist books, even Rick Steves' very good books, or reading things like Waking Up White or White Fragility is not the same as actually visiting the new and different place. What we tend to want to do is be tour guides when people visit our place, when people visit our homeland, being a member of the dominant culture, it's we who need to be travelers, not hosts. We need to be visitors and guests. 
There's a scene in the movie Cry Freedom that illustrates the difference between being welcoming and being a guest, between invitation and equity, between colonialism and self-sovereignty, the difference between being a good white liberal and actual justice. If you don't know, Cry Freedom is a Richard Attenborough film about the friendship between South African anti-apartheid leader Stephen Biko, who became a banned person under house arrest and was eventually killed by security police in prison, and white newspaper editor Donald Woods. And the film is about how they became friends, and Woods, after Biko's death, becomes banned himself under house arrest and smuggles Biko's story out to the world. Denzel Washington plays Biko and Kevin Klein, Donald Woods. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. And early in their friendship, Biko is hosting Woods at a little cafe in a black township over dinner and beer. And Woods as a, you know, is a good white liberal. And Biko explains to him how that is so condescending. Biko says to him, you white liberals want to give us a better education so we can get slightly better jobs. But we don't want or need to be you. I don't want to be what you want me to be. I will be myself as I am. You invite us to sit at your table with your linens and your china and your silver tableware. And if we dress like you and eat like you and speak like you and act like you and use your fancy white things as you do, you will kindly let us stay at the table. We don't want that. We want to wipe this table clean. It is an African table, and we will sit at it in our own right as Africans. Before you white people arrived, we had our own vibrant culture and civilizations. Let me explain one way it was different. Our language, there is no word for aunt or uncle, no direct translation. My niece calls my wife not aunt, but mother sister. That's the word in our language. We say mother, sister, brother, son. There are no separate words apart from the words for family. Oh. All begin with brother and sister, mother and father. Biko is at the level of adaptation on the IDI. <laughs> Woods, when he first meets Biko, is at minimization and grows into acceptance and maybe more. And this is the way church works for us, I think. We want to be diverse. We are welcoming congregation. We invite and invite and invite. And still, people of color don't flock to our doors to learn how to do religion just like us. The key to widening our circle of concern is to widen our circle of relationships. And you can't widen your circle of relationship by inviting others to your house. The way to really widen the relationship is accept invitations to the other's house. And if not invited, have the courage and the willingness to be uncomfortable to go knock on your neighbor's door and introduce yourself. Widening your circle of concern requires you to go to places where everyone's not like you, to places where you are the visible minority. You are the one who's visibly different. How eager are you to do that? Is it any wonder there's not a lot of people of color in our church this morning? <laughs> How eager is anyone to do that? No one likes to be uncomfortable. Think about it for a second. When was the last time you went somewhere new to experience something new and meet new people where you knew you would be the only person just like you, other than perhaps your friend or your partner who went with you? A place where you would be the only white person, the only English speaker, the only person of a different religion, the only straight person. And yet this is the call and challenge we face. And when we so willingly invite others to be here, it's all well and good. We should keep doing that, but it's only half the battle. 
Where are the places you, where we can be the visitor, the guest, the tourist, the traveler, the person out of place, and meet people at their own table where they eat in their own way? Where can you attend a religious service, a community organizing meeting, a cultural festival that you can visit and bring back a wider circle of concern and a broader perspective? Thanks for watching this sermon. I'd really love to hear what you think about it, so leave a comment, and I'd really appreciate it if you could like and subscribe to the channel and share it with others. Thanks a lot.